Cheers. Um, thanks for coming along. I know there's some really good talks on at the same time as me, so I appreciate you being here. Um, yeah, so this talk, for Optimist, our UI is pretty pessimistic. Um, this isn't a tech talk. This is more of a UI um, user experience talk. Um, so we're not going to go like really deep into anything technical. Um, the main idea of this is to sort of you know plant some seeds um, and get you thinking about some things for when you come into um, for when you work with your apps and sort of taking these approaches into account. So to begin with, optimism. Just to clear up um, what these fancy words mean. So optimism is a positive approach to events. So entering event, uh, entering some concept with the idea that things are going to be A-OK -okay and we're going to leave that situation with a positive effect. So for example, before this talk, I could come in here and be like, hey, I'm really pumped for this. I think this is going to go well and people are going to enjoy it. So that's an optimistic outlook. And on the other end of the spectrum, I've got my clicker, so bear with me. <laughs> we have pessimism. And pessimism is the complete opposite of optimism. So pessimism is, as it states, so emphasizing or thinking of the bad part of a situation rather than the good part. So we're entering a concept or event with the idea already set in our mind that things aren't going to go as planned. Um, so I could, before this talk, I could be like, oh, I'm really worried about this. I'm not sure how it's going to go, and people aren't going to enjoy it. So before I've even entered that concept, I've already got a negative mindset in place. But how does this match up with the UI? So the company I work for, um, Buffer, if you don't know Buffer, we have an app that allows you to buffer um, like things like tweets and Facebook posts into a queue, and they send them out automatically. And this is a part of our app um, called the Composer, where you compose these updates. And this is what I've tagged as a pessimistic UI, because the users, you know, they compose their updates, and they hit buffer, and then they're shown this lovely view component, which is blocking them from doing anything which we know is a progress dialogue. And this is pessimistic, because we're, you know, we're, we're not quite sure what's going to happen with this, this um, request that we're taking place. We're making an API request. And because we're not quite sure what the outcome is going to be, we're blocking the UI until we know what the, what the outcome is. So this could succeed, and we can close the activity, or it could fail. And we recently changed this um, to have a more of an optimistic approach. So you enter your text into the composer you hit buffer, and then the activity closes, and you can continue using our app. And already, like, if you're on a, maybe you're on a slow network or for whatever reason, you're already free to do other things, and you can, carry, you can multitask, you can carry on doing other things around the app. Maybe you want to edit some updates or delete some stuff or manage my social feed. And that optimistic approach gives the user much more freedom to carry on doing what your app is made to do. But why do we find this in apps? So if you open up an app on your phone now, and, and I know a lot of apps on my phone, this is a common problem of you know, blocking UI. But why? Well, unfortunately, it's a predictable behavior. Like, users expect that. Like, a lot of apps I use, um, I expect there to be a progress dialog pop up when I go to save something or, or, or send something or make a request. Um, I expect that to happen, which isn't a good thing. It gives us an error-prone implementation. Like, if something does go wrong, the user's in the same context where they were originally carrying out that task. So you don't have to worry about showing some error message or, or some dialogue in some completely different part of the app, because the user's in the same place they were when they made the request. And finally, the most important part is that it's easier for us developers to do. Like, it takes like 30 seconds to spin up a, a dialogue and show it to the user while that request is taking place. So you know, if it makes it easier for us, why aren't we going to do it? But there's some issues that come with this. So as we know, users have to wait. So that progress dialogue is valuable time um, that your users are having to wait before they can continue using your app. Um, and if you're on a slow network connection, that could be, you know, it could be 30 seconds. And the amount of other things you can do in that time adds up if you add it up over like days and weeks and months, et cetera. And finally, it makes the application feel slow. Like some users won't pay attention to their network connectivity or is their networks dropping because your application is in the foreground and that's what they're using. And if your application comes across as being slow and they're in the middle of using it, then that's what's going to get the blame. 
And then that leads on to recommendation, like, are you going to recommend that app to your friends if it's bad? Are you going to download other apps from that company if, if you've already got a bad impression from this one app? And so on. So, but why does this happen? Oh, there you go. This is what happens when I try and be fancy of animations. Why does this happen? Um, why do we still have these implementations in our apps? So to begin with, um, I tried finding some interesting facts for this. And I came across this, this white paper written by someone called Robert Miller. Um, and it was labeled the response time between man and computer interactions. But we'll call it between human and computer interactions. So it's written over 50 years ago. And it was originally written in the context of typewriters. So when you hit a typewriter key, the amount of time you expect to see some, some state change on that paper is 100 milliseconds. Um, so that's the point of your finger depressing from the key and then seeing that print on the page. So you're expecting to see that, that response in 100 milliseconds. I mean, that's pretty quick. <laughs> that's 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 seconds in time. And the scary thing is that I tried to put this into a, a realistic value. And most of us blink. The average time is 15 times per minute. And if we divide that into a minute and stuff, we get between 100 and 150 milliseconds. So that means that by the time you blink and you're using an app, like you should see some form of state change on the screen. Um, and you could argue that, hey, the progress dialog is state change, something's changed, but it's not the state that the user is expecting within that app to make a change. The second point is, there you go, um, is network connectivity. Like, we're, as developers, like when we're in our home or our office, we're quite common that we're connected to like an extremely good Wi-Fi network. Um, at home, I, I never have a problem with my Wi-Fi. So when we're making things and, and, and we hit, say, say if, I, say if I hit the buffer button, um, that, that happens instantly. And I, I never even really saw that progress dialog because it happens so quickly. But this isn't the case all the time. Like Sometimes I'll walk down the road, or if I'm traveling, then my network connection isn't as great when I'm on my mobile network. And this isn't, this isn't just a one-off for some people. There's a lot of countries where poor connections is such a common thing. And, and, and people in these countries always have poor connections. And that's where we come on to this, is these, like, we see a lot of talk about um, other countries and, and the poor network connections when we come to offline design. And so this, this blue one here is, um, is, where is it? The GSEM networks, which is like 2.5G. I can't even remember the last time I had a GSM slash edge connection on my phone. But you can see here, like Middle East, Asia Pacific, and Latin America, like so many people in these places have poor connectivity and these, these slow networks. And, and some apps aren't in a position to be like, hey, yeah, we're going to completely support offline design. Um, that's where optimism can help improve the situations for all users and, and users on these poor connections. And the last point is the failure to think. Um, I used to work for an agency, and I worked with some really good designers, and, and they're really cool to work with, and we were a great team. But thinking back, um, this wasn't that we designed, this is just something I grabbed off the internet, but thinking back to it, um, there was always, I never remember designing or discussing what would happen when content was loading, or what would happen when the user presses a button. And that made me think, like, are people thinking about this? Like, is it just me? Or do people think about what happens in these states, or do we just default to to, to spinning up dialogues or making the user wait, because that seems like the norm to do. And then some people I've talked about this with is said, like, isn't this cheating? Are you, are you lying to the user? Like, and, and no, if, if the user's aware of what you're doing, if, if, if you're displaying that content is maybe syncing or, or something's going on in the background, if the user is aware of that, then it's fine to do, and you just need to handle the states correctly. So moving on from pessimistic, I just wanted to look at a quick example um, in, in our app, in, in the, the Composer, where, this, where we changed this. Um, and like I said, this isn't going to be a technical um, demonstration, but just something that we explored to do. So this, these are called finishing activities. I couldn't think of a technical term for this, but situations where you carry out a task, maybe you hit save or you change something, and the activity closes once that request is complete. Um, so it's quite a common place in apps where this happens. So in our case was the composer. So when the users compose an update, um, we close the screen. So you can see here, 
Um, we've typed our text. We perform some actions such as hitting the buffer button. Um, and we show a progress dialog. Then we wait for the completion. And when that's finished, we handle the result. And if that's successful, we previously close the activity. Otherwise, we handled the error. And what we want to do here to remove this pessimism from, from this flow is get rid of that progress dialog. Um, that's a step too far. Get rid of that progress dialog and, rem and remove the waiting from that flow. So we perform an action, and then we need to move on to the next step, which is closing the activity. So we're, as soon as we perform the action, we want to close that activity and handle the response once that screen's out of the way and the user is free to do what they want. And the first step here is obviously the easy part, is removing the progress dialog, like just deleting that from your code and getting rid of that. Um, common component, in some places they are needed. So things like, um, like signing into an app, like you need a network connection there, so you can't really get away from that. And, and things like maybe e-commerce requests, you could argue that they're needed. But there's a lot of places where they're not needed. And the first reason for this is SDK 26, which is Android O. So progress dialogues are now deprecated. Um, obviously, that doesn't stop you using them, um, but it's a good reason not to use them. Um, the they recommend here showing like inline progress um, bars in place of this. But you can at least remember this screen and, and what I've said when, if you try to use it. And even if you do, you'll be shown this nice strike through when you try and use the class in your code. And the second part is shifting things to the background. So if, if, you're, if you have an activity open that is performing some form of request, you can shift this task to the background most of the time. And there's many ways that you can do this in Android. And the first thing that we experimented with was shifting things to the background service. So when the user hits buffer, we kick off a service, and we finish the activity. Um, that service does your, like, carries out your asynchronous work. Um, and then you refresh the content. Um, Maybe you, maybe you change the state locally first, or maybe, maybe you wait until that request is complete to refresh the content. But either way, the request is taking place in the background, and the user is free to carry on using your app as you intended. So for this, we just use an intent service, um, just a standard service class from the Android um, SDK. Um, allows you to do stuff in the background um, off the main thread. And you know, this worked perfectly, because you know, we, we're using um, we're using this flag here on return, so if, if the service failed or it was killed by the system, we could fire it back up, and it worked fine. We didn't have any issues. Then came Android O. Um, so if anyone here has looked much into Android O, there's been a bunch of changes that have come with background services. So now we're not free. Our application isn't free any longer to run in the background. Um, so we can't. So all services are affected. So we can't um, start. So if we start a service when our application's in the foreground, um, and our application moves to the background, um, then that service will be killed. But if our if our service is running whilst the application in the foreground and that request is taking place, then it's fine. Foreground services, such as the things you see when you're navigating in, in Google Maps and or Spotify, um, they work fine. And also the same for bound services, which are things used in um, inter-process communication. So. You could say, hey, fine, I could still use the intent service, like my app's in the foreground. Um, but the thing is, if, if the user moves away from your app, um, now in Android O, there's a, there's a small grace period where your service will still run, um, but then it will be killed. Um, I don't know the exact time, but I think someone's I've read it's between 60 and 90 seconds, um, which could be long enough for some places. But I don't think you should rely on that, um, because you don't know when the service is going to shut down. And that's where we come to the job scheduler. So if you're not familiar with the job scheduler API, um, we can use a job scheduler to schedule tasks against the system. And this is the recommended um, API to use in place of background services. So we can schedule jobs based on network connectivity or priority, um, or to be run at several times. And the great thing about this is now that when the user hits, hits buffer, we don't have this in place yet, because um, we're still using the service. But what we can, when we use a job scheduler, the great thing about this is when we hit buffer, we can schedule the job to the system, and the system will take care of it for us. And this has a lot of advantages to using a job scheduler, because the system can be intelligent about when these, when these jobs are executed. So for example, say if we kick off um, multiple, um, multiple requests or, or schedule multiple jobs, um, then these can be batched to be run at the same time, which can be more efficient, and it can save our device like battery power and stuff. Secondly, we might not need to post 
the task instantly. Um, for example, say if, I, say if I'm buffering a tweet for two weeks' time, like, um, it doesn't matter if it goes out with now or, or in the next five minutes. Like, the system can be intelligent about when that goes out. Um, we can wait on specific conditions to be satisfied. So say if I'm sending out, uh, want to send a request that involves like a massive image, um, I can wait until the user is connected to Wi-Fi network before I do that. And just schedule the job to wait until there is a Wi-Fi connection in place. And we can repeat tasks. So let's say we're making requests like repeatedly to, to sync with the server in any means, then we can, tell, we can schedule the job scheduler to do this um, periodically. So one of the things that the next step in after we um, shifted to a service was manipulating local data, local data. because uh, fair enough, like, so that, that screen's been closed um, after we've kicked off the service, but is, if the user can't see the change in the UI, that feels like only half the way there. So what we did was, because we, we, we put a database in place to cache all our content recently, and what you can do is, um, which is a, a similar approach to designing for offline, is, is writing your content locally first so that this is visible to the user. So when that service is kicked off, we can, we can write the data locally um, and update our adapter to display the content, um, and then still kick off the service, and then if it errors, we can handle it from there. And we have a lot of cool libraries and APIs to make use of this. So for example, if we're using RxJava, maybe we start a service or, or a schedule a job. And when that kicks off, we immediately write our data to our database. Um, and maybe we're subscribing that to be reactive so that gets updated in our UI. And then if that errors, we can handle that. Maybe, maybe we have some custom error that maybe deletes this from our database when this fails or, or so on. We can handle it how we like. I mean, like I said, we, if we're observing for these changes in our database, we have some, some core APIs to do so, such as the recycle view swap methods to update our data um, when these data changes. And like I said, if, you're, if, you are, if you are dealing with stuff optimistically or offline, it's important to reflect the state. Like the user should always know what's going on. If, if the data is currently being like, ref um, refreshed with the server, say if, uh, they're not seeing say the data they've changed locally isn't quite isn't synced with the server yet, the user needs to know that. And there are a bunch of apps that do this well. For example, Trello. Like if you move if your phone's offline and you move a Trello card, um, you're shown shown a sync icon to, to, to so you're aware that this isn't update with the server yet. And we have other apps such as Facebook and Instagram. Um, when you hit like or or heart when you're offline, they both show you a little message I haven't got that there, but they both show you a little message that says that this will be posted or, or the, the change will be reflected when you go back online. Um, and you can see here, even though my device is offline, that like is still, is still um, that state is still reflected that that's happened. So there's some states where we need to handle things such as errors um, if things don't go as planned. So for example, um, if when we kick off that service, if that fails, um, there's multiple ways we can do this. Like The user might have left the app already, so maybe we go back into the app, and it's clear to the user on this, this card that this, card, this update has failed and hasn't gone out, um, and that they need to retry that. You can do intelligent stuff with job schedulers and so on to, to retry things, but um, in our case here, we simply show a failed message, and then the user can handle that um, as they please. Another thing to take care of is, you know, you can show error dialogues if things go wrong, but that kind of goes against the whole blocking UI that we're going for. So I believe that error dialogue should only be used if, as, as a last resort, if, if there's no other way for you to show an error message within the context that the user is in. I find snack bars to be a great way of us showing errors in our app. Um, so on the bottom here, we have these four tabs. Um, and all of these tabs, uh, at these bottom navigation bar items and these tabs, they're all within in a single activity. So the user can move between these. And, and if the user's carrying out actions on these cards, like moving them around or deleting them, then the snack bar can always be visible within that single activity, no matter where they move between those screens. We can also make use of notifications to let the user know that something has gone wrong or something is in process. Um, as you can see, there's an icon in the top left there. The user know that, that the buffer app is currently doing something. But if, if, if something fails, then, then 
it could be something that's time sensitive, and, and the user needs to be aware that that hasn't gone as planned. And if, if you're familiar with the notification API, you can use things such as heads up notifications so the user is aware that something has gone wrong. Um, for in the case of us, the user might have buffered a tweet to go out at a certain time. And if that doesn't go out, then their client's going to be unhappy and so on. So we use a heads up notification to let them know that, that the post has failed. Um, obviously, this does throw them off the context that they're in at that, at that time. But if it's time sensitive, then they need to know that. And also, as of Android O, we have notification badges. Um, so in Android O, we have to implement notification channels and split out all the different types of notifications into sort of um, groups channels. So we can do stuff with error notifications, and we have a group for that so that um, we can have different priorities for those notifications so that the user is always seeing them in the application. Um, and just a, a last note, um, I kind of feel like optimistic design and, and offline go, go hand in hand. So for us, um, obviously, the dream would be to have like, full offline support on our app. But because we're dealing with a lot of legacy code and, and the code base isn't, isn't that tidy at the moment, it's hard for us to sort of do a complete overhaul and, and support offline fully. And I find like optimistic design is, is a, a step in the right direction. Um, because we never had a database before, and we needed to put a database in place to support offline, um, to support optimistic designs, so we could cache things and, and react on that. Um, and it also gives us the benefits of a few other things. So as much as I love this cute character we have when there's an error, um, it was quite annoying seeing this and still seeing it whenever we open the app. Um, if you don't have a network connection, we just throw an error. And you know, it kind of looks a bit crappy. So, now, now, having that, now having a caching method in place to, to support, off, um, support Optimistic allows you to make use of that data in places in your app. And whilst you're not fully supporting offline, you can still reap some of the benefits of having that data available when the device doesn't have a connection. And the same goes for progress bars. Like, because even if the connection is slow, we already have data available to display to the user, so we have no need no need to show that progress bar. Um, again, we can show the cache data and show in some other place on that screen somewhere, um, or in, in say it's bar, that, that that data is being um, synced and the fresh data is being retrieved. Cool. Um, so that's it from me. Um, like I said, um, yeah, so like I said, it wasn't extremely technical, but I'm hoping some ideas have been planted like for future when, you're, when you go away and, and you work in your applications to um, implement some optimistic approaches. Um, and hopefully you'll see the, the benefits from it um, in the speeds of your application. And like I said, we're not breaking any, any groundbreaking territories here, um, but hopefully there's some ideas that you can take away from this. Does, oh. <laughs>